for example, some people, their emotions get the best of them sometimes. But in fact, they have the power to control that if they want to, if they understand that. So I mean, I'm interested in how much of what you do is teaching people to learn to, um, to work with themselves, to control themselves. This comes down to what you do before the game. I think this is going to feel really weird for you because uh, you're on the other end of the interview or I don't like to call them interviews. It's more like a discussion, but what's it like being invited to an interview discussion? Yeah, it's surprisingly exciting just to, for someone actually to want to talk to you uh, because, you know, I've spent a career uh, as a journalist interviewing people. I've uh, very rarely been interviewed myself, so uh, it's a bit of fun actually. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It's been really awesome to know you over the... 13 years and I feel like it's important to note our inception of our relationship and uh you go ahead tell me what it was like I was 18 uh, I was a, I was a baby yeah well I mean I remember I remember the first time we chat very well I remember the exact spot on the the Star Sydney casino floor where we had our first conversation uh I was um I just started doing some poker reporting which I fell into by pure fluke I mean you don't think you're going to be a poker reporter it hadn't even crossed my mind um, didn't know what poker was growing up really to be honest and then um, sort of fell into doing some some work with the star in Sydney and I ended up uh, they launched a, a website for um, star poker website and they wanted some content on it uh, that's a longer story uh, that I'm sure we'll get into later but um, but so I was just you know doing some coverage not even full live reporting but just some basic result coverage and interviews with players uh, for the events they were starting to have at the Star. And um, I mean, I can't remember if it was an APPT or ANZPT or what it was. But it I was a- APPT, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, and you were, I think you won one of the side events, didn't you? And I interviewed you uh, just there next to the table after your win. Uh, I remember you had this little, like, handheld little, yeah. like, I think it was an MP3 maybe device. I mean, this was ages ago. Like, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you weren't really doing video things or anything. And uh, it was more just re- recording it and then you would type it up, right? Like, you know, Yeah, was, yeah just yeah. write a story with some, some quotes and a little bit of a background on whoever had won that particular event. Um, I think that was that would have been pre-video sort of video podcasty mm-hmm. days, wasn't it, by, by quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's... I sort of that's how I got to know players originally was I was interviewing them at uh, at the Star in Sydney. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean it was uh, an interesting time for me. Uh, I was eighteen. Mm. I just won a tournament for fifty thousand dollars, and to me, like you know, as an eighteen year old kid, was like the dream. Mm. And uh, it's been a crazy run since then for me, and uh, it's been awesome to see someone like yourself throughout. I guess my career just kind of like always being around it was actually been it's somewhat comforting for me um because yeah. you're not a competitor so it's been like quite nice to have like a friendly face around all the time and um yeah it's it's good to see that you're still here kicking on and you've had uh you, you've had quite a lot of uh experience within only not only poker but also rugby league mm. so you're well and truly within the uh sports world and one of the reasons why i wanted you here was to see how we can uh, get some conversations going around like mindset, peak performance and the things you've witnessed. Yeah, I mean, I guess for people that, a lot of people watching this, some would know me, some wouldn't, but they might not know that I started as a rugby league journalist. That's all I ever wanted to be growing up was write about footy. I mean, I couldn't play it. Look at me, I'm too skinny. I did um, I did have a guy that ended up playing NRL, went to my school and I remember doing like a high school trial and trying to tackle him. And just remember lying on the ground, looking up at the sky, dazed, going, that was, I just got hit by a brick wall. Oh, goodness. So I knew pretty early on that playing was out of the question, apart from the lack of skill. Um, so <laughs> I, I but, you know, <laughs> but I loved, you know, I still love the sport. I still love all sport. I watch sport 24-7. So I just wanted to be a rugby league journalist, and that's what I became. I wrote for Big League. I wrote for The Telegraph. I became sports editor of MX newspaper, and I spent, probably seven or eight years as a full-time rugby league journalist um, and then moved into sport and by, you know, life just takes you in funny directions, ended up in poker and also just general casino gaming um, stuff that I do now. So um, so that, yeah, that, that journey has been quite interesting. But as, as you said to me when, when you asked me to, to take part in this chat is um, comparing the mindset of football players and poker players and, and how there might be crossover. I mean... 
I think it's int- I've been putting a lot of thought into that today, particularly bef- before we sat down here, in just what are the similarities uh, at that sort of level of performance. And I think for uh, the, the main thing I see um, is, is preparation for sustained peak performance, um, no matter what discipline it is. I, you know, I spent years watching you, you know, Nathan Hindmarsh's and Steve Price's and all these players, Billy Slater's. Um, you know, I'd get to training and just watch them working hard and in the gym uh, and they had their routines and um, I, I actually I wrote, I wrote Steve Price's um, autobiography with him and spent quite a bit of time with him in New Zealand. He was playing for the Warriors at the time um, and just sort of watching his general preparation and it was a lot about, you know, diet and routine and, uh, you know, all, all that sort of thing. So, um, and I find a similar thing when I speak to whoever it might be, yourself, um, you know, Grant Levy, any of, the, any of the poker players that that um, that want sort of repeated performance over time at the tables, that, and those guys that seem to achieve it is, you know, making sure their mind is in the right place, which is often preparation, um, life balance, uh, diet, exercise, whatever it might be for that person, seems to be the thing. But the one thing I mentioned to you before we, we started our chat here was um, one little thing that I have noticed is you've got to do what works for you. And you know, I'll, I'll go back to um, what one of the, actually one of the NRL coaches said to me, I think it was Steve Folk said to me, is that um, every, every player is different and you have to find what works for that player. So in terms of, you know, from a coaching perspective, some players need to be given a barrel full at half time if they're not performing uh, those need to be blasted because that wakes them up but other players no you need to give them a cuddle you know some players don't respond that same way now I'm sure the players find it the same thing and I, I mentioned I, I really remember the final table of APPT Sydney in whatever year Aaron Benton won at 2010 sometime around then 29, 2010 I remember Aaron um, he, I think he went in the final table as either chip leader or close to but he had a really slow start to that final table. He just nothing was happening. He wasn't playing well. I remember him telling me after he won it, I think he won about six hundred and fifty k for that event. Um, that the difference was he he just went and had a beer because that's what he always does when he plays poker. He has a beer and he chills. He relaxes him, and he did that. And from that moment, he said he started to play his own game much better. So, you know, I think um, finding your routine and finding what works for you, uh, whatever that might be, football. Sport, um, poker, anything else is what I, I seem to notice that um, that is pretty important. Mm. It's amazing. I think a lot of the things that you're that has come up for me when you're talking about the idea of, I guess, you know, coaching of, of what Steve folks I think you mentioned used to would do and how it would differentiate for each person. I suppose I reflect on how I work with my students. I call them. I don't really like to call them clients because they're students of the game. Um, a lot of people ask me before coaching, hey, uh, what can you offer me? And I say, well, it's different for every person um, because if I were to offer you a blanket like, you know, here's, here's what I'll do and it's the same for everyone, mm-hmm. then where's, the, where's the, um, the creativity in that? And poker is a huge game of creativity and, and each individual person is so different. And so you mentioned, you know, at halftime someone needs to be either slapped around or cuddled. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's heavily to do with their upbringing. Because when they were children, it depends on how they were nurtured through difficult times or how they were not nurtured through difficult times. And they carry that on. We all carry those things on with us later on in life. So, yeah, with some of my clients, you know, they need more of the listener. Mm. They need me to listen to their experience and their anecdotal um, stories of, of what they've gone through so they can get it off their chest. And they feel better knowing that, oh, okay, I've, I've got it out there into the world and and I've got an experienced person giving me some adequate feedback. But then other people literally, I do most of the talking Mm. within sessions because they want to just absorb, like it's so different and it's really fascinating and it's so cool to hear that about the rugby league stuff. So how do you, so when you've got a a student you're working with, how do you go about determining what it is that that specific person needs? Well, firstly, I want to say that you've broken the rule, which is I'm interviewing you. You're not allowed to ask me questions, Ben. I know it's part of your DNA. Didn't you say it wasn't an interview though? Was uh, that's chat? true. Yeah. I keep saying it's an interview, but it's not. Okay. Yeah, it's not. Um, yeah. Good, good question. So um, how do I figure it out for, for each person? Yeah. Well, usually I think people know. I think people mostly, because I don't, it's 
the the point where I help people is not getting from like nothing to the foundations. It's often people looking to get from mid stakes to high stakes. Mm. So, and when I say that, I mean, I'm not talking about like nosebleeds because there's another level after that. I'm talking about most people, especially now with these APT and APL tournaments coming up and, and really rising the bar um, from, you know, getting close to that casino type level. Um, people are looking, there's a huge pool of people right now who are like pub players who are looking to go up to these like 1K and these, you know, Goliath 2.5K ones. And there is a significant shift in um, how you approach that. So when people come to me, they they often have this uh, foundation already built. And it's kind of difficult for me because people already have established bad habits. Mm. And it's way harder to change that than it is to create new ones. But anyway, how do I work with them? Um, like I said, mostly they know. It's just about them having someone who's experienced enough to identify flaws in their dialogue. So they'll talk to me and they'll tell me hands. So often I need to hear people talk about hands, talk about um, mindset, talk about preparation, all those things. And I can identify things that like, okay, from my experience, this is where you might want to look a bit closer. And often their response is, yeah, I kind of felt that. You know, it's like we we kind of have a, mostly I ask people about, you know, what, what is it? What's inside of you? What's telling you? What's your gut telling you? Because mm. that's often going to be pretty close to it. So if they're saying to you, I kind of felt that, are they maybe they're looking for a little bit of validation that, yes, that's the way they should be, that's the thought process they should be going down in that spot. They just need somebody to back them up. Yeah, and look, that's the same for anything in life. We This is why I hate the idea of lockdowns and that, even though obviously we needed them, but like being in isolation is a really, really bad idea for anyone. That's why we put people in prison for doing the wrong thing. It's a punishment. Um, but we need to be talking to people to organize our brain, to organize our mind, to organize our life. And so when you talk to someone, you're able to tell someone else who has about like, you know, their own consciousness and different views of the world and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and when you do that, you, the more you talk, you're organizing what's going on and you're getting it out there and then someone else can go, yeah, cool, but, but hang on, what about this part? And, and you know, you can, you can work that. That's why, I mean, right now, you and I are figuring things out. Mm. Like We're going to come to the end of this conversation and be like, cool, I learned a few things. Yeah, well, I'm, I've actually got more questions for you, so it feels like <laughs> I'm interviewing you now because now, now you've piqued my curiosity. I'm going to allow this now that we've brought it out, but yes, I'll ask you just one more on this track. Okay. So when you're working with a student on, on you know, just say that someone, as you say, that's sort of looking to step up to the, that next sort of buy-in level and I guess next level of um, skill and thought process required, um, how long does it take you to train them to think the right way if that's what that, that player needs? Yeah, everyone's different. Um, some people I literally might only have one session with and they feel confident, confident enough to be on their way. Um, the other aspect, I suppose, about what I do is that I offer different types of coaching. Um, so a lot of it actually is mentoring mm -hmm. because if you think about the roles of, say, you know, what's a counselor, what's a psychologist, what's a psychiatrist, what's a coach, what's a mentor, they're all so different. And so in our field, a mentor is someone who shares lived experiences. So they kind of guide you along and give their own experiences and say, hey, from what I learned with me, this is what I recommend for you so you can avoid danger. Right. Whereas coaching, I'm not the expert. Mm. So I, I call myself a coach because it's just better understood, you know, in our communities. Oh, okay, they understand what a coach might be. Um, but when... I'm coaching someone, they are the expert in the relationship. So if I was coaching you, for example, and you said, hey, I really really want to step my game up and I want to go from mid stakes to high stakes, I would say, well, which areas do you think that you might need to work on? I wouldn't say these are the areas you need to work on. Mm -hmm. And so straight away, I've put the, the, the ownership on you. I've put the autonomy back on you so that you can go, okay, well, I should probably work on game selection or bankroll management. And it's like, okay, good place to start. Where are you at already? What have you played? What haven't you played? Have you played a big tournament? What was that like? And then they get to share. Because, you know, we sit there at the poker table and we, we don't share things. We just sit there in our own heads and we experience it. And you go and maybe you tell some bad beat stories or whatever, but you don't get actual deep 
analysis when you can actually get into this coaching session where you can really get it out and organize everything and then you know like i said i would keep coming back and going okay so this happened that happened this happened and that happened and which part was significant for you which was good which was bad and as you keep sifting through all these things and you eventually end up with let's say after the first session a pretty good idea of what you need to work on and what's already going well so you can double down on what's going well hmm. That was very interesting to hear. You know what I found really interesting was when you were chatting to Mike Maddox recently because I was up at the Gold Coast Deep Stacks last year, the WPT Deep Stacks event. You guys were at the same table. I think we wrote a little post in our live reporting that it was the, the battle of the mindset coaches mm. at the time. Do you – did you – sorry, I'm still interviewing you and I shouldn't be. But <laughs> So when you were sitting there playing Mike – I don't know if you knew Mike was a mindset coach at I that did, time. I did, yeah, but okay. yeah. yeah. Is that do you both think about that when you're playing at each other? Is that are you aware of that? Is it does it come into thought processes during hands? Yeah, this is interesting. I, I think if you ask Mike or me, we'd probably give you different answers. Um, for me, it's actually more to do with just fundamentals mm. because I don't expect him to make a mindset mistake. Right. Good. <laughs> I'm going to keep it at that, you know, because Mike and I are probably going to play again. Yeah. And uh, I still enjoy playing and I still, um, you know, would like to compete in some big tournaments. And mm. I like to give away a lot of information. But when it comes to personal things about single people, um, you know, I want to keep, keep it pretty simple. That but, makes sense. But like I said, you know, it's a very big compliment to Mike. I would, I would say that I don't expect him to make a, a, a mindset mistake. Mm. Um, so when we're playing, it's, uh, it's a good battle. I enjoy I enjoy the process. What's your schedule looking like for the... Next few months on the poker tables, you're playing a bit, or I'm not going to answer that because I this that that was it. You said one asked, more question, yep. there was already two more. So I can't we're, help myself. we're coming back to you. Right, we're okay, coming back go. to you, Ben. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's come back to like uh, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, you you're at these tournaments from like literally start to finish. You're one of the biggest grinders I know in the poker world because you you can't get knocked out. <laughs> So you're there all the way to the end. So like, are there any like stories of like really top performances that you've seen um, from anyone within Australia or overseas or, or anywhere in your career? And like, yeah, what, what was it like? What happened? What can you share with us? I mean, I'd have to say that if in terms of live reporting, I think that Landon has done a lot more hours on the ground than I have. Uh, my colleague Landon. He's, he's a um, true grinder, Landon. Uh, remarkable. He's, um, he's great. He's, he's the live reporting guru in Australia, no doubt about that whatsoever. Absolutely. Um, but in terms of myself, I mean, it's hard to remember back to the days when I was doing a lot of hours on the floor. Um, more recently, both the, on the Gold Coast last May and, and more recently in Brisbane when – I was sort of following with our reporter up there what was happening is Alex, Lins Alex Linsky. Mm. And I was, I was actually, it's funny we talk about Mike Maddox because I was really enjoying at the WPT Deep Stacks Gold Coast final table, Alex and Mike were engaged in a, a battle almost every hand. Mm. It was constantly those two not letting each other take us. I was back and forth the whole time. That was really interesting to watch. There was a hand Alex played against one of the other players at the table. I can't remember who it was, but... Alex caught him down all three streets with King High and he was right. And that hand fascinated me. I haven't had a chance to ask Alex about that actually, but he just caught him down with King High and he was right. Um, and that was, you know, I was just watching Alex do his thing and you could just tell that he was on. And, you know, once he puts that game face on. So I was pretty impressed watching Alex. And he's, I've watched his progress too um, from sort of smaller tournaments, uh, you know, in Queensland a number of years ago and in Sydney to what he did in the November 9 a few years ago and sort of, you know, he's, I mean, he's a bit similar to you, Alex. He doesn't play as much as he used to, but when he does, you know, he means business. So Alex stands out in my mind for sure. Um, in terms of any individual performance years ago, to be honest, they'll blend into one. I can't remember that many tournaments. <laughs> I guess for you, it's just uh, your, your, you have a different mindset of like trying to get your job done rather than see, see yeah. those things. But it's interesting. You mentioned that about Alex. Mm. I, uh, I keep trying to get him on here and yeah. he keeps saying no. I okay. said, come on, man. And then he find and then he goes and wins another thing. I said now, and he goes, how did I know you were going to ask me that? Yeah. But he's just not, uh, he's just not, um, you know, 
he just doesn't like having these types of things, which everybody has their own thing. And, yeah. you know, quite often poker players keep to themselves and that's, you know, it's up to them to do that. Yeah, we tried to get Alex on for a live cast after he won in Brisbane recently, or Gold Coast recently, but he, uh, he said he was too tired after the win. So, yeah, uh, I mean, it was a good excuse. I don't think he wanted to do it anyway, though. So I think um, with him, though, from what I'd say, which is not really me, him, n- not really sharing his experience, but from what I've observed, I think what Alex and many other people have is this perfect balance between caring and not caring enough. You know, like you you might see Alex turn up with thongs on and, and shorts and, and, you know, like whereas other people will be there with a bag and they'll be there with their nice outfit on and apples and, and water. and But Alex just kind of like he's just got this really, you know, chill facade about him. And he's clearly worked a lot on his game and played a lot over the years. So he's got the foundations in there and it's just now about, you know, oh yeah, I'm here to play and I'll do my best and, you know, mm. if he's not, not, who cares? He's not worried about trying to look the part like some players want to wear the, the poker stars jumper and look like a poker player and then they might actually really be one. In the- some of them look like a walking billboard. Yeah. It makes you wonder, you know, like either it's like the person, if you see someone wearing, wearing a nice suit, it's like, is that the rich person or is the rich person the one that looks homeless? Because mm. in the other ones, trying to look rich, you know, like... At, at the, there's a point, if you try too hard, one, once you get to a certain level of wealth, you don't care anymore or success or, um, in Alex's case, just a level of poker that he's very comfortable with, you know, he doesn't need to look the part. Uh, you know, it's different. Remember back in the those days, you know, the, the I guess the payday of poker in Australia, I mean, everybody was wearing sponsored gear, it wasn't they weren't didn't have sponsorships they were just getting buying poker stars jerseys or get jumpers and getting them yeah. but everybody had something they had the poker stars full tilt headphones on and you know everybody tried to look like the young up and coming poker pro at least you don't see that too much anymore which is good yeah you don't and i think that a lot of that is to do with just all the regulations around online poker mm. you know because so many different countries have so many you know rules yeah. and that against it so it's like what can you advertise and what can't you and mm. and then there's also the argument of if you're playing poker and and trying to make money from it you don't really want to make too much noise and say that you're making money from it Exactly because right. of tax things and whatnot. So, yeah, I think that's probably why nowadays you don't see much um, of that. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, you know, you've been following a lot of the online stuff that um, Joey's been doing with, with trying to work with the Online Poker Alliance and that trying to get yeah. it back in Australia. Um, do you think it's coming back? Like, what do you reckon? Well, I am going to be catching up with Joey in the next few weeks, actually. Um, I... I I know that Joey is pretty busy with a lot of stuff at the moment, so I don't want to say too much. But um, could you give us a give us a quick a quick rundown of what he actually did back four years ago and or five years ago, I suppose it was, just so that for people who weren't, aren't following. Uh, well, I've got to got to try and remember exactly what he did. But I mean, I mean, Joey founded the Australian Online Poker Alliance. Um, he was sort of uh, you know doing whatever he needed to do behind the scenes, meeting with politicians, sort of lo- helping lobby to get online poker regulated um, and did a very good job. I think it's more than a one-man job, particularly now. So a lot of it, respect for the effort that Joey put in. Um, where Poker Meet Australia, we get contacted all the time and there are some people that are very, very keen to get involved and help. Um, and Joey, if you're watching, when we do meet up for a beer in the next few weeks, I'll be talking to you about this. But there, there are some people that want to get involved and help because um, you know, I think it... I think it might be at the stage now where it needs a concerted push by multiple people to try and get this thing over the line. The talk for a couple of years, and a lot of Joey said to me not long into the COVID thing was that he felt there was a lot of momentum being gained and then COVID happened. And obviously the the priorities of government for the past two years have been a little bit distracted from that sort of thing. The other issue that I think is a genuine issue is gambling in Australia as much as it's a massive industry and I mean I, I should just say too that aside from poker media I work for a company called Inside Asian Gaming based in Macau but we cover Asia Pacific and it's a B2B gaming industry media so I follow what's happening from a regulatory standpoint across the region quite quite closely and one thing that stands out about Australia is that okay our, you know Australians love to gamble tax revenue from gambling is enormous from poker machines but at the same time, gambling is a dirty word and it's this funny little clash of heads between the fact that you will see what happens with Crown and everything and that the media in Australia generally are very anti-gambling. So what benefit is there for a politician to go out and support legalising or regulating any form of 
new gambling or certainly online gambling. Of course, the, there's a logical argument for that. Better to have regulated gambling than unregulated gambling. But we've got to get to a point where politicians aren't scared to support something like that. And that's what I'm worried about is I'm not sure there's anybody out there at the moment that's willing to back online gambling or online poker. But I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. It's a tricky thing. Hmm. It's super tricky. I, I'm on the fence with this because I like to to do the best I can to live an organic life. Hmm. I guess I'm talking as a player in this sense before I talk about anything else. But as a player, you know, it's it's not that healthy to play play online, hmm. um, especially tournaments because well, you start and when you start, you're locked in. You get a five minute break every fifty five minutes, and you might be there for ten, twelve hours. It's not great for us. I mean, there's a lot of things we do that aren't great for us, but um, this in particular, you know, if for people trying to play all the time, it can it can be pretty detrimental to the rest of our life. That said, like anything, if you have it under control, it could be very balanced and a nice recreational thing or profitable thing, whatever you want to do. I mean, you mentioned why would anyone have an interest like a, as a politician? Well, how about to keep all the money in Australia? Yeah, that might be a good one. That, uh, well, I'll, what I'll say is there are good arguments for it. Uh, that's the, the most simple argument is the fact that not legalizing and regulating online gambling, be it online casino, online poker, whatever it might be, does not mean does not mean that it, you've stopped it from happening. It's happening. Mm. It's under. It's happening. I mean, we saw there was a statistic I saw just after about two months into the original COVID outbreak last of uh, twenty twenty that online gambling three weeks into lockdown had risen 67 percent well there wasn't sports betting because there was no sport happening anywhere around the world so it was online casino probably online casino more than online poker so it's there people are playing on unregulated sites we know that that's just a fact and um, so if that's the case what's the reason for not regulating it because at least by regulating it you're going to provide you know you know aside from tax revenue you're also going to make sure that you provide players with a safe platform to play on where the their money that deposited is guaranteed, and if they win, they'll be able to withdraw their money. There are all these concerns. You know, you don't even know you're getting a fair game if you're playing on an online casino that's based in Thailand or whatever it might be. Mm. You know, so the, the the argument for regulating online gambling in Australia is that it's safer. That's. I think that's probably a pretty mm. key thing, isn't it? Because mm. like the online poker world has really had its uh, dangers clearly, and from. Black Friday back, what I guess it was like 10 years ago now, yeah. um, Black Friday really shook everything up and it made everyone very sceptical. And I mean, even before Black Friday, though, there was a lot of scandals of like people, um, you know, doubling up on accounts on the same table and, and mm. double teaming people and, and all sorts of collusion thing. Um, Raf's an int- interesting person to talk to about this, uh, Raf, yeah. Rafaman, uh, because, you know, he did a lot of that for PokerStars. Um and so just seeing like someone so regulated, like a company so regulated like PokerStars, they would have teams of people watching hand reviews, you know, the back end seeing everyone's cards just to be constantly monitoring and all mm. that. Um, if you play now on all these apps and all these like online things from who, who knows where they're running from, how do you ever trust it? Yeah. It's a good point. You can't ever be sure. And, you know, I know... Of course, there are some sites that are doing their best to be to be trustworthy, and well, let's not go too much into the online poker world at this, on this particular chat. Yeah, but um, but you know, the the only way to be sure, and I'm not talking about any form of online gambling, uh, is to make sure that it's regulated in Australia, and that way you can make sure that it's a trustworthy game, that players' money is safe, that if they win, they'll be paid. You know, that those are the the key things. So, if from a politician's point of view, if you truly want to protect the Australian people, the Australian players, banning it isn't going to stop people, so regulate it. Mm. I think the original reason for banning it was something really stupid like, oh, the health of our people in Australia, we don't want Mm. them gambling at home, right? That was like the main thing. Well, online poker was caught up. That wasn't even the target of the – well, we've had the the bill, the the, the, whatever it's called, I can't remember off the top of my head, but the gambling bill in Australia that – that when that was tightened five or six years ago, which is when all the online sites left, I mean, poker wasn't really meant to be part of that. They just caught up in it. It was really targeted online casino. So if you look at, I often get the emails from, from ACMA, the regulator, mm. saying all these sites that it's banned. It never mentions poker sites. It's all these online casino sites that they've caught and have blocked. Mm. And that, that's their target. But poker's just caught up in it. So that's, now while I say I'm, I'm 
not sure whether politicians will back online poker or not. I think they're much more amenable to online poker because that's never what they're really targeting in the first place. Mm. And Joey will tell you too that he's met with certain politicians who are known to be anti-gambling and they actually agree with him. They just can't be seen to agree with him publicly. So. Yeah, there's so much in it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, because then the politician, if they stand for something that could jeopardise their own journey or, or appearance, whatever, that could ruin their career or, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, fascinating uh, world mm. we live in. Um, what I'll say is it will happen eventually. The question is when. Will it happen next year or in 10 years' time or in 50 but, years' but time? But when it happens, do you think that it'll be we would only play against people within Australia or...? Oh, I hope not. Yeah. I hope not. Because um, that like doesn't have, sound like very f- much fun at all. No, no. You'd like to have global liquidity. Um, well, you want more. You want bigger tournaments. Yeah. yeah. It, it depends on... You need to make sure that those who are... By the way, there was talk that there was a bill being put together a couple of years ago um, around online poker regulation. I'm not exactly sure where that was. So, mm. But I'm hoping that whoever's involved in that has a true understanding of what they need to do. If they're going to... So if you're going to legalise online poker, what does that look like? So if you're going to make it Australians against Australians only, well, you know, you're not really giving players what they want anyway so you know i hope that when it does come in it's got some sort of decent shape and decent regulations around that yeah do, do you reckon it's had an impact on like i mean right now a lot of these live tournaments when they get up and going and when there's no restrictions on borders and whatnot it seems to be getting more and more numbers and especially in these mm. higher buy-in fields and that um i think that i mean that has partly to do with the fact that you know people aren't really playing online um mm. i say really with an asterisk um, but yeah, I mean, like, have you been quite impressed with these numbers? Have you you've been like numbers. under, did you underestimate this or overestimate this? Like, I don't think I ever put a, a figure on it, but I've got to say, I mean, over the, the past few years, uh, even a couple of years before COVID, the numbers on these events, and I mean, the thing we've seen is these sort of mid-tier events starting to come through. So APL Poker Tour, Australian Poker Tour, uh, WPT, QPC, all that sort of thing. Um, these sort of mid-tiers have really played a big role in this, so where you're sort of getting your $200, $300 buy-ins. It's just, I think it's taken the game to the next level because it's provided a stepping stone for your pub player to take the next step because you don't want to go from $25 on a Tuesday night to $3,000 at the casino. So now there's a stepping stone. I think that's brought a lot of players out of the woodwork that are just loving this opportunity to play you know, pretty good venues with proper table, good chips, um, you know, big fields, so good prize money at the end. I think that's really helped a lot. And plus just the fact that, yeah, I think that's played a part in it, that there's, you know, for for a lot of these smaller stakes players, there is no online poker in Australia to play. Uh, so this is how they play and where they play. And the numbers are massive. Mm. The other thing is that when we went to WPT Deep Sacks Gold Coast last May, that's, that's the first time I'd seen a lot of those people for a year and a half. Yeah. And yeah. I remember, I think you already felt that way because I had a great atmosphere in that room, just people catching up again. Because people used to see each other, even if they lived in different states, they'd still see each other 10 times a year at events. Yeah. They hadn't seen anybody for two years. So, You know, M- Matt Wakeman and I were talking about yeah. this in our other episode just before Christmas because, uh, you know, he, he mentioned that um, – Playing live is not really the smartest option for a full-time player in terms of return on investment because, you know, if you were playing online, for example, you could play so many games in one time and you don't even have to leave your house. So you don't pay flights, accommodation and all the other crap that comes with that. Um, But he realized how much he got out of this social, Mm. you know, thing. And and I've realized that too. So I agree with you for sure, you know, like being in that environment, you know, you're seeing all your, your kind of like friends around or even if they're not your friends, at least you're around people and you're talking about a, a shared interest. And mm. yeah, I never really saw it like that, to be honest, pre-pandemic because for me, like every time I'd go to tournaments, it'd be like I'd be in just like competitive mode. I'd mm. be there to be like, okay, these are all my obstacles to get to to what I'm trying to achieve here. Mm. And I'd, I'd almost even just being in there, would be I'd be in a state of like slightly elevated you know stress levels yeah. even if I wasn't on the table part of that is also because when I'm in in that room a lot of people try and ask me questions and things and they want to share hands with me and stuff and you know I'm trying to compete as well so that's a bit challenging at times but um now I do yeah like even just when I'm at a tournament if I get out of it or something I'm like eh, whatever 
Mm. Who wants to do something? <laughs> yeah. Well, one one thing I want to do this year um, is I'm actually determined to play quite a bit more myself because I spend so many hours and have spent so many hours watching poker that um, and, and and in past years in previous times of my life I didn't have the money to really play much but I'm in a better position now and um, you know, I've got the money to play and I'm quite keen to sit down and play and I want to play live tournaments because I really I, I do love just sitting down and chatting to people and being part of that and plus I'm pretty competitive as well so um, that's something I plan to do this year and I really look forward to it I really look for and, and again I'm probably like a lot of players so I love the opportunity now to have these $250 to five hundred dollar buy in tournaments, which is a sort of a sweet spot that's very affordable with pretty good prize pools too. So mm. yeah, if you see me at the table, you'll probably take my money. But well, I still owe you a session from many years ago. I promised I'm, you a session. I may hit I, you up on that. You, actually, you've still got that in the in the uh, my debt to you. Um, but Possibly before WPT Sydney in the lead up to that, we might uh, sit down and have a chat. All right, but now that this is on, uh, you know, this is recorded. Yeah. When you win, hmm. you have to be my, my like you know you'll be all over my website, my pet. You're my success story. All right. You know because everyone's right. gonna know you had a right. session with me before WPT. So when you win, you got to say hmm. it was because of. It, it, you say I can't only say it was me. It's me and Brendan. Or if there's there's no sign of me ever playing, if I if I don't cash in any event, then we'll just pretend this conversation never happened. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone everyone's already forgotten. Excellent. So, yeah, I, I can't lose here. It's a free roll for me. There yeah. you go. Not for you because you're risking your money, but for me, it's a free roll. <laughs> it's uh, it's fun. No, I look forward to it. It's, uh, yeah. It's, It'd be good. It, it's uh, interesting because you've kind of gone from the reporting and you're going more into the playing, and I seem to be going more into some sort of reporting <laughs> type thing with uh, the swings and roundabouts, isn't that's it? That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm sure we have a lot to share with each other in terms of knowledge. It, it is. Um, I, I get the bug when I'm doing live reporting, and by the end of a by the, by the end of a four or five day event, and just watching hands, and you see you know, you, you see some pretty interesting play go down, and you, you watch players and what they're doing, and you you almost feel by the end of it that you could sit down and play much better than you normally would because you've just been taking it all in for days and days. Of course, you don't see showdown on every hand, but you see a lot of stuff. So yeah, I'd um, I'm quite sure that. I've got a couple of events coming up. I'll be doing some reporting and I'm, I'm going to have the bug by the end of that for sure. It must be really hard to like constantly be watching but want to play yourself because it would constantly give you more of an itch, wouldn't it? I'm better, I'm much better um, with experience at compartmentalizing when I'm working. And so, you know, so back in the day, you know, I, well, back in the day, here's another thing too, just in terms of live reporting, we talk about um, discipline and preparation as a player, I found that's just as important with live reporting because we're talking about pretty long days here and you've got to be you're typing and watching and being part of it the whole time. So I've become much better at my routine and also compartmentalizing that I'm working when I'm live reporting and I'll, you know, I'll think about poker at the end of the day, you know, and I'll think back to some of the hands that I saw at the end of the day, but at the time I'm just working. So even a small thing like, you know, back in my earlier days, I might go on, on the dinner break, I might go have a beer. I don't do that anymore because I've still got another six hours of work that night and it does make me tired after a couple of beers, even even one or two. Mm. So I even on live reporting, I won't have a, a beer or a glass of wine until the end of the day's play. Mm, mm. Mm. Well, when I start coaching you, mm. there'll be zero beers going on. Okay, none of this uh, Aaron, Aaron Benton beer on a 600K final table, none of that. Right. No, we're yep. going to detox you. You'll be detoxing eight mm. weeks before the event, just so what, you know. What, so no no. But, you know, so I just came back from Adelaide and I've got about 20 boxes of wine in the spare room. So I'm not allowed to touch so, it now. Well, I mean, you've got now until eight weeks before WPT to get through all those wines. <laughs> okay, geez, I'll be drunk for a couple of weeks then. Um, well, look, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, you on the, on the table rather than uh, reporting. Um, and it's funny, actually, as you were talking about, like, you know, you observing so much poker, you know who I'd love to actually coach into becoming a really good player? Okay. the massage therapists because those guys would be seeing people's holdings yeah imagine that they've been massaging for years and then all of a sudden they know how everyone plays they've literally watched their whole cards <laughs> that, that's probably part of their strategy is yeah <laughs> that's, their, that's their long-term get rich scheme is after a while they know exactly what to do in every spot because i've seen it 
Oh, I actually don't think they need to play poker to get rich. They're getting two dollars a minute. No one right. in that poker room. Cross tips. Yeah. Even, even the best players in that <laughs> poker room are not making two dollars a minute. I can guarantee you that. No, they and yeah, I love those guys. How good are they? They're amazing. always there. Amazing, amazing. Um, okay, so let's. Um, I want to talk. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about how we cultivate and. Uh, I guess, motivate ourselves at the start of a new year going into like a new phase. You know, we've had this little mini one month kind of like lockdown blow up of, you know, this Omicron business has made everyone kind of freak out and then go, oh, well, that's it. Now we've finally, you know, let it rip, so to say. So now let's focus on life again. And now I think that there's no more lockdowns. So poker this year, I believe, is going to be a huge, huge boom in mm-hmm. Australia. I think every there's going to be a tournament every two or three weeks. I mean, I'm sure you know the schedule pretty well. Um, how do we cultivate and motivate ourselves? Because I think like for you, for example, working in the field, I mean, you're going to Adelaide tomorrow to do the, the stacked poker championship. You know you're going and, and part of your prep is, well, okay, I've got to take these things with me and I've got to do these and I've got to do that. Like it's all pretty mapped out for you. Mm. The tricky thing with poker players is, well, A, poker players are horrible at organizing mostly, mm-hmm. um, but B, it's very unpredictable. Even if you do organize your schedule, it's a high chance you'll be out way earlier than you'd like to be on each event. So what do you do? Mm. So what do you reckon you could say to someone who's a poker player who wants to cultivate their dreams and motivate themselves going into this new year with a bit more certainty? What do you reckon? What would you say? Oh, geez, you're probably better off at... I mean, you know what it's like to map out a schedule and for it not quite to go to plan. I mean, that's that's going to happen to every single player regularly. Um, my, my perspective on... I don't know if this specifically refers to poker or sitting at the poker table, but um, my, my thing moving forward at the moment is finding the right balance because I have you know a full-time job with IAG, I, poker media... Um, I, I own part of the company or I'm part of the shareholding group. Um, and so I've got these two things that are competing for my time, although I enjoy both a lot. They're, they sort of mix together, but they clash as well. Mm. Um, and then, of course, I'm, I'm married, so I've got my wife and, and dog at home. So, what, Who are you married to, the wife or the dog? <laughs> well, I spend the most time with the dog. So. <laughs> but, um, but. Yeah, so, so for me, and, and this is not just this year, I've been working on this for the past four or five years because I, I was at a point where I was very bad at take, giving enough time to my family because I always had work on my mind because um, I'm fairly busy uh, So and I wasn't particularly good at allocating that time well. So I'd be at the dinner table on my phone looking at work messages and um, my wife would be getting um, quite reasonably quite angry with me. Um, so one thing I've worked on, and I have improved quite a bit is just getting that right work-life balance so like I'm going to work till this time of day that I'm going to stop and just chill and cook dinner or go out for dinner and I'm not going to think about work for that time just scheduling out my week better uh, and when when it's not work time it's not work time you know mm-hmm. so just leave that now because there'll always be things that pop up that you have to do but so I think that it's very important to to map out and break up your time into things that need to be done so I mean I would imagine that's pretty important if you bust out of a tournament early, take that time to go and chill and prepare for the next one. Don't jump into the next thing that starts. Mm. That's what I would think. You brought up some good stuff here. Mm. So I think the first thing, which is probably one of the, the biggest things I work with people in terms of the mindset stuff only, not fundamental poker stuff, but mindset stuff. The first thing really is how does poker fit into your life? So I'll, let's strip this apart because I think it's important. For, for a lot of people, poker is a recreation for them. They'd like to make money from it, of course, but re- the reality is it's recreational for most people. So what does that mean for your family life? What does that mean for your social life? Because if you're not careful, poker can absolutely consume you and destroy you. Mm. So there needs to be parameters put in place. And I say that because I'm talking to myself here because I, I, I've had these times in my life where it has completely consumed and destroyed me. Mm. It's a very, very challenging thing when that happens because if it collapses you and you fall into the, the deep, dark pit, getting back out is very hard because often when you fall into the pit, your money falls in there too, your relationships fall in there and your health falls in there. Mm. So the prevention is much better than the cure. So 
coming back to what I was saying, so the 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 first thing I would say to someone in mindset coaching is how does poker fit into your life? Does your partner support it? Does your family support it? You know, often it's like, oh yeah, yeah, they do. They they let me do my thing. But it's like, okay, no, let's talk about that because if they don't support it fully, you're going to be sitting at the table feeling guilty for being at the table. That's already a barrier for your performance. So part of um, working this through, I would suggest and, and prescribe for people would be go and have a conversation with your family, whoever that means to you, whoever's close to you and your family, and tell them of your ambitions, tell them of your dreams, and tell them how you're going to um, approach it. You know, tell them how much money you're going to put it. Like really, really make everything open and clear. And then when you have a bit more of a transparency there more trust gets built. Mm. And in my experience, the the trust that you can build there will give you a far clearer mind to be 100% present on the table when you're actually playing. So most people don't think about this, but but all of this really, really starts at way before you even sit down at the tournament, your performance. And so the other thing you do is when you're not at the table, like this is why when you were talking about the balance with your wife and, and work and all that, when you are with your family, you're with your family. Mm. You're not with poker, you know, you're not thinking about when you're going to play or I've got to get out to play or whatever it might be. Or if you bust out in a tournament and you're away, give them a phone call, Mm. check in with them, you know, maybe if they're there with you, take them out for dinner, like do those types of things. Don't go and sit at a cash game just because you're bored, Mm. you know, things like that, right? So I think um, having those honest, honest, open uh, conversations with your loved ones is a great way, place to start. Yeah, absolutely. There's one question my wife asks me every time I go to play poker and it drives me insane, which is, and this is tournament poker, what time will we be home? And I say, I have absolutely no idea, hopefully very late. But um, yeah, she, she asks that regularly. But, you know, she, she's been great because, you know, I'll be sitting at a table because I, I love playing the, the weekly Wednesday at the Star. Yeah. And when that's running, I, I play that a bit. So, you know, she'll ask me, how are you going? You know, how many chips have you got? That sort of thing, which is nice because, you know, she's happy for me to go out and play and I don't play that often. But, but to your point about, you know, heading into a tournament series and, you know, often busting out earlier than you hope, I mean, to me, the logical thing to do would be to set yourself a schedule for what you're going to play and stick to it because then you've got a bankroll that you know you're going to spend and, and hopefully you, you make profit on, on top of that. But um, I, I, that's, to me, the, the best way to get that balance in both bankroll and time is to know exactly what you're going to play and if you bust out, you bust out. Mm, mm. And following that, following through with that plan is also key because yeah. if you say, you know, I'm going to go to the next four tournament series and you set your plan, but you don't follow through with it on the first first tournament series, mm. you've already created a bit of uh, mistrust within, well, yourself mm. and your your family members who you've made that, you know, deal with. So it's going to make things a little bit more tricky for you. Not impossible, but just more tricky. Probably and probably going to be particularly important for a lot of players this year, as you say, because we're going to have back-to-back series. There's going to be so many series this year. We've already, I mean, I think I mentioned to you that Poker Media will be, uh, in the next week or so, will be in Melbourne for APLPT Melbourne, in Brisbane for the, the Star Treasury Series, and in Adelaide for the Stack Series, all on at the same time. And this sort of thing... I mean, that's, a, that's an accidental scheduling clash that happened. It, it's none of them meant for them to all be at the same time. But we're going to, you know, obviously we've got coming up in Sydney, we've got APT in Sydney in March and then straight into WPT Deep Stack Sydney. Then there's also a Club Marconi one too. Yep, and there's Poker Palace has got a, a yeah, few that's series. What I meant. Yeah. yeah, that's same, yeah. Poker Palace. Yeah, Poker Palace yeah. uh, at Club Marconi there. And then also there'll be APL PT Sydney, which was announced recently. So I think this is going to be the trend this year and the, the appetite's there, but... For players to go and play in a lot of these series is going to take a, a fair bit of planning and I think um, discipline to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're spot on. You know that 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 uh, for people who and I think everyone's got that bug. Everyone's kind of like been you know locked up for so long that we we now want to kind of get it out. And I think it's great. I mean, wh- why not? Right? We we want to live and enjoy life and be free. Um, I just think that from my experience, um, it's a it's sort of a uh, sort of my my moral obligation to help guide people from the the dangers of what I see mm. if it's not carefully um, mapped out well you're you're the perfect example I mean as you've said I've known you since you were 18 and I've seen 
your journey. You know, I've seen, you know, I saw when you went through some tough times and um, not that we're, we're, we've been, you know, close, close friends all the time, but we've always been in touch. Um, so I've seen you go through that. I know you were fully immersed in poker as a young kid and I've spoken to you many times where you've, you know, you, you mentioned to me that you, you just had to find that own sort of balance in your life where poker wasn't everything for you. You know, there's a, there's a few of the guys that are pretty successful on a tour that I've spoken to, you know, like, like Mike Maddox and Sam Adams and these guys that do seem to have a, a real good grasp on um, just a discipline and, and that work-like balance that you sort of need to succeed. Mm. It's interesting. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, I think over time as well is a big big factor. Um, time, I'm starting to realize this. I don't know if I don't know how I'm realizing this. And I think I'm finally maturing, Ben, mm. um, which I thought I'd never say. Um, but time is a funny thing because a lot of people get tricked by this game where if you have one decent result, you think, oh. I'm a professional poker player. Mm. Cool. And then you tell your friends that I'm playing poker all the time and that's what I do. And then next thing, you go to the next tournament series and you lose maybe 5% of your bankroll and then you go to the next series and you lose 10% of it and then next minute you've gone the rest of the year not winning anything significant again, which is a very, very high chance, by the way. And you might have still made a slight amount of profit for the year or maybe you broke even by the end of the year, but you mm. still think that you're some sort of professional player. So time over time, you need to be able to manage yourself through all that. Mm. But the thing is you could get to the end of the year and you might have broken even or you might still be in profit maybe 10 or 20K, even though you had a 100K score at the start of the year. Mm. Um, was it really worth it for you? Yeah. And mostly I think if you really looked at it from a gratitude point of view, you got to play cards all year and you've made a slight amount of profit from it. Mm. Not many people in the world can do something like that. Exactly. I remember remember when Joel Dodds won in Sydney WSOP circuit event. I was really pleased for Joel when he won that because I know he'd, he'd been on the, the Aussie tour, the ANZ PT, and he'd been sort of, he was grinding all those events. And Joel was a, a pretty solid player, but I know he had a tough time of it there like a lot of players did because it's so hard to make a living doing that so I was really glad for Joel to have a big score there but um, I mean I look back at the players that were in those early days and there's very few of them still around playing I, I barely see any of them uh, except for the guys that aren't poker players they just have a lot of cash and love playing poker they're still around <laughs> well that's the thing so so that it comes back this I'm glad you said that because it comes back to the the first thing I ask people you know like wh- where does poker lie in your life because for some people, it brings them serious joy, mm. not just when they win, but just all the time. You know, they get to sit at the table, they get to engage in a, in a fun game that's like challenging. It's like one of the best games that will challenge you fundamentally, you know, from all aspects, mathematically, creatively, all those types of things. And then the, the well, there's the gamble aspect as well. So there's an element of like uncertainty, which is where a lot of us like to live. But like you know, like it or not, people want to control everything. But really, you don't want to control everything because where's the excitement in that? It's mm. like watching a movie you know the ending to. That's boring to me. You want mm. you want to like twenty percent of your life to be completely uncertain. You've got to have that. You've got to have that massive flip for your tournament life. Exactly. You know, yeah. You've got to have that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's honestly. I mean, that's that's what gets us going in the game because yeah, there's you know you want to be able to control as much as you can and, and input your own skill and all that, but if you won every single time, I heard this funny thing actually, it might've been a TED talk on gambling or something, but so gambling is fun if you don't win all the time. Actually, gambling's fun if you almost win all the time. Hmm. So you sometimes win and sometimes don't, but almost winning is like the place that gamblers lie. If you won all the time, it now becomes work. Because yeah. you expect to win. It just You just expect to get your paycheck because, you know, if I do this and I'm a profitable person in whatever field it might be, then the more I do it just means the more money I'll get from it, which means I have a job. Mm. <laughs> it's no, quite fascinating looking at that's it That's exactly way. right. No, that's a, that's a good way to look at things. Um, to kind of do a loop back to the idea of like, you know, mapping out a year ahead where there's going to be so many events going on everywhere. Mm. Um, how do we do that effectively so that we can have the best chance of success from our own individual journey, but also have that balance so that, you know, if it goes well, you still have great things going on in your life. Mm. If Because the, the other thing that's, that's what I've learned is um, even if you win lots of tournaments and do really well, 
if you haven't taken care of your health and if you haven't taken care of your relationships in the in the process, you actually have failed, mm. in my opinion. I, I look at life as a holistic, you know, point of view because wh- why wouldn't you? Like most of those really top tier poker players, if you ever go and watch them, you can see the deadness in their face mm. because of how much poker they've played. And it might look all glamorous like they've won all this money and they're the best poker players in the world, but... I wonder really what's going on behind the curtains. Yeah, especially when you watch those super high stakes players and the money. I mean, one of the one of the reasons they're playing those high stakes is almost because they have a desperate need to play at those absurd levels, um, which makes me wonder why. Why do they need like it's, nobody would choose like you and I? I, can't, I wouldn't even want to have anything to do with that playing at sort of level, but for those players, it's almost like a compulsion. I don't I don't really understand that compulsion that they've got. There's a really interesting podcast series. I think it's called the Paul Paul Pua Fua. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. Paul Fua. I think it is. Paul Fua um, podcast, but it was hosted by someone else, I think. Mm. And they go through an interview like Eric Seidel and Tom Dwan and all those, and and some of the stuff that comes up for them. You know, it's it's all along the lines of this. You know, the why are you playing these nosebleeds? Mm. And even like Eric Seidel was he was disclosing lots of things about his upbringing and that about mm. being competitive. And from what I've discovered in psychology. It's all to do with like childhood stuff. Yeah. It's all to do with like, oh, well, I was never good enough as a kid with this or, you know, maybe I was never the captain of the school but always a prefect or there was always something that maybe I had an older brother who was the, the light of the world and, and I wasn't to my parents. Like, mm. But, yeah, I wonder that because I, I, I was watching some of the um, the GG like high roller streams where they have like um, I think Nananaku or whatever his name is, Nanoku doing the commentary or whatever. And um, it was fascinating, like, just seeing all these same names on there all the time. Yeah. It's like, surely these guys are all just losing to Rake. Well, it's a it's a very small pool of players constantly playing against each other, isn't it? So, mm. uh, But I think, you know, I don't know what drives them, the competition, the, the need to be the best, I don't really know. Mm. I don't really know. Unless you're Michael Adamo, then you're just crushing high-stakes tournaments <laughs> and everything's easy. Well, see, even that, I mean, the one I was watching the other day, like he, he won it for like, you know, half a million, but he was in for nine entries on, mm. a, on a 10K buy-in. And yeah. it just kind of makes you wonder how many other ones, maybe there's all these re-entries and no win. And, and yeah, so I wouldn't be so fooled. I mean, he's he's probably making a lot of money. There's no doubt about that. I'm probably, uh, you know, but who really knows? Mm. I mean, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes for other people. And so, yeah, I think often often what comes up in some of my sessions with people as well is that they they reflect on other people's mm. success, especially, and again, this comes back to the time concept because they might say, oh, my friends around me are doing well, but I'm not. Mm. I would say, well, hold up a second because they may be doing well now, but can they sustain it? Mm. And, you know, Maybe you're just at a stage where you need to be challenged on a different level and maybe you need to learn a few things about your journey before you get a decent run where you can capitalize off three different results in one go. Like you never know when that's going to happen for you and your friends may not be profitable players. Mm. So why are you letting that beat you down? You should use that to motivate you. Mm. You should ask them about their experiences. Learn from them. Use your friends as tools. (laughs) I think every player should ask themselves if they're enjoying playing at all times, because that should be the ultimate goal is are you enjoying playing? I've never understood players that smash the table or berate the dealer or, I mean, that that get blatantly angry at the table. You know, I've never really understood that. It's not in my personality to do that, but I've never understood it. If you're playing poker, um, first thing should be to enjoy it. And, And that might be if you're playing at a professional level, than enjoying the process of becoming as good as you can be. But for someone like myself, yeah, I want to I want to be as good as I can be. But really, I just want to play. I just enjoy playing. You know, I've got no no grand ambitions of winning the World Series of Poker. Um, of course, I'd like to win money, but I enjoy playing. So for me, just play, taking part, working on my game, which I do. I work on my game when I get a chance to, um, like everybody. It's all part of the process that I really enjoy. Yeah, and and, and even um, you know I, I'm I'm pretty well headed into you know when I bust out I bust out I just get up and go and I I don't I don't abuse my opponent or anything. It's what's the point? You're going to bust out of most tournaments you're playing anyway. So I think that's um yeah one thing even as an observer over time and watching how players respond to 
being at the table, uh, you just got to enjoy it, got to be happy. So, so this is interesting. So the, the psychology thing that I'm learning about now, which is quite interesting, is when one event is the same event that happens, take a pandemic, for example, mm. pandemic happens, but everyone's uh, interpretation of that is completely different. Mm. Um, and so what do we do with that? Because some people get angry. Some people have seriously benefited off the pandemic. Mm. There has been a pool of people who have seriously benefited off it. Um, but the same negative thing has happened. So, so in poker, you know, you and I might be in the, in the same hand, the same scenario, but, but, you know, where we both get rivered, for example, for our tournament life. Mm. And I might get angry and bang the table, but you go, eh, it's okay, you know, I'll move on to the next one. Yeah. What's the difference? And it's like they're, they're triggers, right? So for me, I might be triggered by that because of something that's happened to me along the way. So again, th- this this is something I work with people on, which is dealing with the stuff that's going on underneath. It's the self, it's the inner journey, you know, like what happened to me in my life that makes me feel entitled to win? Mm. Because when you lose, you, you have to know that you're going to lose. Mm. You don't go into a game. Everyone logically knows this, but they don't emotionally like um, have it play out correctly, I would say, or, or effectively, they know they're not going to win. But when they when they don't win, it's like, oh, that happened to me, mm. right? It happened. I, I'm like a victim in this situation. But then someone else might be like, oh no, I expected that I'm going to lose eighty percent of the time, or whatever. In certain, you know, we 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 rationalize it, but some people can't. And so I think that the best place to start with that is to deal with all these things off the table. Deal with your relationships. Deal with the, your, we call it narrative therapy and counseling. So um, you're the protagonist in your own narrative and you actually have the power to create who you are. If you want to be the hero in your journey, create that. Like how do I want to act on the table when I get unlucky? That's a good question to ask yourself. That's, I, that's something I'm keen, something I've been thinking about a lot recently is I don't think a lot of people fully understand how much they have control over themselves in many ways. I mean, for example, some people, their emotions get the best of them sometimes, but in fact, they have the power to control that if they want to, if they understand that. So, I mean, I'm interested in how much of what you do is teaching people to learn to um, to work with themselves, to control themselves so that... You know, when you get knocked out of a poker tournament, when you've got aces and they've got jacks and a jack hits the river, that you go, that's out of my control. Mm. Nothing I can do about that. Mm, mm. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, that this comes down to what you do before the game. So the default for all of us, and this is a pessimistic, um, cynical view of for me, right, on, on life. Life is suffering. The Buddhists have said that. They've clearly stated that in their literature. Life is suffering, so accept it. That's the first step to the path of enlightenment. Mm. Um, and so when you accept that, well, I'm, I'm going to have bad experiences in my life. So when they happen, how am I going to deal with it? Because that's what you do have control over. Whether you like it or not, bad things are going to happen to you. That's the, the suffering or the, the true, the tr- uh, what do you call it, the, um, the stupidity of life. Yeah. So... Well, you have a choice then. You can suffer a little less by consciously working on yourself and it has to happen in the pre in the in the pre game stuff, you know, with everything in life, but let's say poker specifically. So in my med- meditations that I've created and I do personalized ones as well. You know, we we would put that in there, you know, like how am I going to hold myself in those difficult situations? How am I going to hold myself when a card comes down that makes me lose a hand where I expected to win the hand or I was a 95% or whatever, you know, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be seen by your peers? Like these are pretty decent questions to ask yourself. And if you meditate on that over it and you don't have to sit there and close your eyes and meditate over it, you can just like spend some time thinking about it or writing in a journal about it or talking to someone about it, whatever. Then you've already made that aware. You've made your mind aware of that. So when it inevitably happens, you've rehearsed it, you know? So when you get to that situation, then it's like, oh, okay, it's okay. I knew that that, that could happen. So when it happens, you're not as shocked. There's no wow factor. There's no shock factor. It's mm. like, oh, okay. You still feel it because we all feel emotion. You can't really control, you know, your emotions to an extent, but you can cr- control your reactions. Mm. Big, big difference there. Yeah, we still... We still remember the hand we got eliminated from from a midweek tournament five years ago very strongly. 
a couple that I still burn me. Well, the reason but. for that is because your brain is hardwired to remember negative information. Mm. And and that's there's a very good benefit to that because it's what's made our, our species survive for you know thousands of years. Yeah, don't put your hand in the fire again because it hurts. Exactly. Yeah. You're not mm. going to remember the... I think there was this thing that Einstein did where he put up like to all his students, he put up like one times nine equals nine, two times nine is 18. And it went all the way down and the last one was like one number off. And he says, all right, everyone, give me feedback. And everyone stuck their hand up and said, you got that one wrong. And he said, oh, you're going to point out the one I got wrong, but you didn't point out the nine I got right. Mm. You know, so we're hardwired to find negative things all the time. And in poker, this is why so many poker players are negative, pessimistic, victim players, Mm. because the game sets you up for that. Mm. It does. I mean, when I enter a tournament, even if I think I'm one of the better players, I'm going to lose like 85. I won't even min cash 80 or 85% of the time. Yeah. So, but it's interesting too because you, I I feel that you've got to you've got to have an understanding that you're going to lose most of the time in a tournament. You're going to you're not going to make the money more often than you do make the money, and certainly you're going to not run deep that often. Uh, so you've got to have that expectation and ability to cope with it. But at the same time, you've got to go in there with a positive mindset. So it's sort of a, these two contrasting emotions. It's got to be positive, understanding you're probably not not going to make the money. Yeah, and so this is where. Again, you know, we, we have life balance. So you know that, well, I'm going to do my best and I, I hope for a, a, an optimistic, you know, a good outcome. But if it doesn't go well, it doesn't matter because I've already, you know, seen all the other good things that are going on in my life, like my relationships and my other ventures or whatever. Um, and I suppose you know, this is a good place to probably leave our conversation because I think that the key gem I would leave us with here, it's something that is not new wisdom, but gratitude is one of the most powerful ways to handle all this. So being grateful for all the things you do have and not what you don't have is going to fuel you through some seriously negative things. Hmm. So when something bad, it's like the silver lining idea. If you get if you get rivered and you get unlucky in a tournament, well, you've got some free time now. That's something. I mean, I would rather get rivered in the first level of a tournament than on the bubble. It could be way worse. Your situation is prob- might feel bad, but it, it could always be worse. Yeah, especially on the Gold Coast, let's go to the beach. Perfect. Exactly, yeah. you know, yeah. you can go check out the meter maids or something. Yeah. But <laughs> Do they still exist, the meter maids? Oh, I don't know. It's <laughs> probably the last time I've been in the Gold Coast. But yeah, so, so you know, when you, when you practice gratitude, and I say practice because it is a practice, you have to, you know, whether you journal or whether you pray or whether you, you know, work with a therapist, whatever it is, you know, you, you try and find those optimistic things that are going on on a daily basis. Um and I'm saying this not to say that I, I know better than anyone. I'm saying this because I say this to myself to remind myself to be doing these types of things because it is a practice. And our default is often negative. So um, I think that's a great place to leave us today, Ben. It's been good, Brendan. I've enjoyed uh, – uh, it's not an interview, is it? It's a chat. But I've it's enjoyed just uh, sitting here chatting. And, yeah. Awesome to see you and uh, it's, it feels uh, weird seeing you in person because I actually don't think I've seen you for about two and a half years. So uh, no, I, Oh, no, I saw you really briefly up at the Gold Coast. Soon the Gold week. Coast, um, you didn't see me. I dropped off some soup for you when you yes, I had COVID la- uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. But I didn't see you because obviously you were isolating. Uh, I think I saw your brother yeah. briefly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks for being on here. It's really cool to have you on the other side of things um, yeah. and to get your, pick your brain a little bit. So yeah, I appreciate awesome. it. Thanks, we'll Brennan. see what it, it sounds like. I'm going to see you on the table at one of our next tournaments. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Awesome. Thanks, mate.